Results have dramatically changed amblyopia clinical practice pattern for many eye care providers. So basically, I am not uh, going uh, uh, from 1 to 20, uh, 23, but uh, uh, relevantly, so first and foremost is regarding refractive correction. ATS-5, it was conducted with the aim to evaluate effectiveness of refractive correction in moderate amblyopia, and they concluded amblyopia resolved in 27% of the patients, and improvement of more than two lines was seen in 77% patients with refractive correction only. And in ATS-7, treatment of bilateral refractive amblyopia with spect corrections improved binocular visual acuity. So... Can you make slideshow? Yeah. But the slide is not proceeding. It is slideshow slide only. No, it's coming. You have to click that bottom, that uh, slideshow. No, you first click on... Uh, can you please click on enable editing there? Do you see enable editing on the top right in the yeah. yellow bar? Protected view. Yeah, just, just say enable editing. Can you Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Has come. Now make it slideshow. Yep. Is it? Yeah, it is visible. Yes. So, what is the clinical implication of this? So, basically, it is reasonable to start amblyopia treatment with refractive correction alone for young children, and a follow up after interval of six to eight weeks. Until unless there is improvement in the amblyopic eye, uh, the visual uh, acuity is there. So basically, children still needs additional amblyopia treatment after improved visual acuity from an optical treatment effect. So basically, in some of the patients, child may not need additional amblyopia treatment beyond optical correction. So this is the one lesson which we have learned from uh, these ATS. Then we have also some experience uh, regarding one of the thesis done at our center. And with refractive correction in our uh, study, the improvement of more than two line was seen in only 16.67% uh, uh, of the patients. So then, whether should we go for penalization or occlusion, ATS-1 was conducted with the aim to compare patching versus atropine penalization for treatment of moderate amblyopia in three to seven year of children. And they concluded both are appropriate modality for initial treatment of moderate amblyopia. So basically what we have learned, atropine penalization is an effective alternate therapy in treatment of amblyopia. Then in ATS-4, they compared daily atropine versus weekend atropine in treatment of moderate amblyopia, and they concluded weekend atropine produces an improvement in visual acuity, which is similar to daily atropine. Then in ATS-8, they compared weekend atropine augmented by plano lens with weekend atropine alone for moderate amblyopia, and they concluded augmentation of weakened atropine with plano lens does not substantially improve amblyopic eye acuity. Then ATS-9 was conducted to compare patching with atropine eye drops in treatment of moderate amblyopia, and they concluded atropine and patching achieved similar results among the children. So basically, what are the clinical implications? Atropine penalization has a similar effect as of two and six hours of prescribed patching. So it can be used as a first line amblyopia treatment or in patching failure cases. Daily atropine administration is not necessary. Twice week uh, schedule is also effective. And there is no reason to believe that atropine need to be administered on weekend, weekend days or it needs to be sequential. Weekend atropine penalization has also shown to be effective in treating both moderate and severe amblyopia. Then ATS-11 was uh, conducted with the aim <coughs> to evaluate combined patching and atropine for residual amblyopia. And it was concluded that visual acuity 
improved similarly in both the groups that is suggestive that there is no additional benefit of combining treatment of uh, patching with penalization in residual amblyopia then in ats 13 non randomized prospective trial of glasses alone for strabismic strabismic and anisometropic amblyopia was conducted and treatment effect was greater for strabismic amblyopia then ats 16 was conducted uh, is being conducted regarding augmentation of atropine treatment for amblyopia the effectiveness of adding a planar lens and the results are not published then what are the drawbacks of ats we have to keep in mind limitations of it yes the strict inclusion criteria hampered the uh, study by including a limited number of the patients methodology was not strict thereby making the results subject to many variations ethnic variation on treatment always remain a factor and another question is is atropine safe in tropical countries and compliance was not monitored then there is no shortcut or substitute for occlusion for occlusion treatment in amblyopia however variability exists in number of hours prescribed to treat amblyopic patients then duration of patching was compared in ats 2a and 2b in ats 2a full time patching was compared with 6 hours of patching in severe amblyopia and they concluded there is similar improvement in both the groups and in ats 2b 2 hours patching was compared with 6 hours patching in moderate amblyopia and they concluded there is similar improvement in both the groups it was noted that prescribing greater hours of patching did not seem to have a significant beneficial effect in first four month of the treatment so what are the clinical implications full time patching is not always needed for a successful treatment outcome prescribing lesser amount of patching may promote better overall compliance with treatment when patching is prescribed it is reasonable to prescribe two hours of daily patching for moderate amblyopia and six hours of daily patching for severe amblyopia Some, chil some children with severe amblyopia will respond to as little as two hours of patching. There is no consensus over duration of patching, and different authors have recommended different duration of patching. Full time occlusion have been supported by many authors in the past. However, the popularity it commands among clinicians is not always shared by patients and their parents. And major failure. that is because of the poor plans and hence recent trends are in favor of part occlusion then is is a bar to treat amblyopia ats3 was conducted whether amblyopia can be uh, successfully treated in older age uh, children that is 10 to 18 year of uh, children and they concluded treatment can improve visual acuity in older children also it is uh, basically amblyopia can be treated in adults because regardless of persons is it is the visual system which consists of eyes brain and visual pathway that can be retrained and visual skill that needs to be retrained is binocular vision recurrence of amblyopia clinical implication is because a majority of the recurrence in children occurs in less than 8 year of children within 3 months after cessation of the treatment so early follow up is very critical and we should not abruptly stop the occlusion treatment then in ats 6 near visual activities they were uh, <coughs> ats 6 was conducted with the aim to determine whether performing near activities while patching for amblyopia enhances improvement in visual acuity they concluded performing common near activities does not improve visual outcome in treatment of amblyopia however there are lot of other studies which are contrary to recommendation of ats 6 then ats 14 uh, was conducted with the uh, a pilot study of levodopa as treatment for residual amblyopia and results suggested that levodopa carbidopa uh, for residual amblyopia in older children and Teenager is well tolerated. And then ATS seventeen uh, was uh, 
conducted with aim to compare the efficacy and safety of oral levodopa and patching versus oral placebo and patching at 18 weeks and they uh, concluded uh, that uh, oral levodopa while continuing to patch for two hours daily dose does not produce a clinically or statistically meaningful improvement in visual acuity compared to placebo and patching so we have also uh, done a study regarding uh, role of levodopa and we concluded that levodopa significantly improve visual acuity and and effect is more pronounced in children who are younger than 8 years and it uh, reduces the latent period effect is maintained till 6 month and it has to be used only as an adjuvant therapy then ats 18 was uh, Uh, done with the aim to compare effectiveness of one hour daily binocular games per day per week with two hours uh, uh, daily patching for seven days per week and they concluded by binocular ipad treatment was not as good as two hours of prescribed daily patching then this amlipad treatment uh, study 18 is <clears throat> broken into two arms and one is non inferiority study and one superiority study they are being conducted then ats 19 is being conducted regarding role of excimer laser surgery for anisometropic myopia it is ongoing study we have also conducted study regarding role of the link is gone voice has gone i think sir snet has come slow what do you think sign nipo can it turn it issue madam yeah, yeah i think it's a internet issue from that side because we are able to hear each other all right yes um, so we'll wait for them to get the internet connection back by the time we are waiting we can have some comments from professor b s goel i think uh, we can label dr dadia as an amblyopia expert and uh, i appreciate the amount of work he has presented and uh, he has rightly said but there is a little difference with him what i observed a long time back was that the accommodation is slightly weaker in cases of amblyopia and near work does stimulate the and accelerates the improvement in amblyopia i would wish that he studies this aspect as well because we had studied accommodation in amblyopic and non amblyopic patients and found a great difference in them but nevertheless the occlusion and patching remains still the par excellence still par excellence and uh, you may decide the time the amount of patching depending upon an individual i think it says to be dose regulated by the child's response and the patient's acceptance but uh, the earlier the done the larger amount of patching done would be better and incidentally my topic for phd was amblyopia done almost about 40 years ago and some of the things which i had studied at that time are trying to be proved correct at this time now that included even meridional amblyopia some brain studies in the monkeys and cats and so on and so forth it's no point repeating them at this time we need more attention to treatment of amblyopia so that we can check children's visual acuity at the earliest uh, dr chavla you have some uh, comments to make actually sir uh, uh, I, your observations clearly tell us that uh, the clinical science and the basic science changes very slowly it develops slowly the rapid advancement has been in technology yeah yes ma'am 
ATS studies have uh, studied so many aspects of therapy of amblyopia, but finally you, you see, see all of them minutely. Subhash has presented them in a very exhaustive way. But if you look at the summary, we come back to the thing that occlusion remains the mainstay. The others are adjunctive therapies. And as far as the duration of amblyopia is concerned, uh, one of the ATS studies also talks of two hours patching being equivalent to six hours patching. That is the recommendation only for moderate amblyopias, not for severe amblyopias. So as Dr. B.S. Goel has rightly said, we have to kind of monitor our patients in their own settings and depending upon their compliance, we have to tailor the dose. But certainly, madam, four hours patching would certainly be better than two hours patching, though that we cannot what... compare the individuals. It yes. may be enough for two hours in one individual. It may require six hours, depending upon the type of amblyopia and an extent of amblyopia. Yes, and uh, exactly perhaps many saying. of you may not be aware that at one time, Cupper's and Bengalter's method were so popular that every hospital was admitting patients, they became little out of uh, fashion completely. And amblyopia became the anchor sheet for treatment by patching and miscellaneous use of glasses and correction of refractive errors. For me, uh, Dr. Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, even I conclude that the treatment of amblyopia is a job frankly speaking, easier said than done. It is uh, very easy to uh, advise the treatment, but as far as the compliance is concerned, it is really difficult task. And when you really face this problem in a very close relative of yours or a very close person, you really realize the practical problems which the parents face. And part-time occlusion is definitely, uh, as far as compliance is uh, concerned, it gives better results yes. than full-time occlusion. And like one cannot be definitely full time is better, uh, as Dr. Goyal said, six hours is always better than four hours. But being greedy for that and losing that four hours also is a uh, thing we have to weigh the pros and cons. So I, I have seen that part time occlusion gives a definitely good results. So we should go for it. There is uh, no harm in uh, uh, patience on the part of parents as well as the doc surgeon doctor is very important. This is what I feel. Well, about the, about the oral treatment, uh, I have had no personal experience about oral treatment. I never tried it myself. But the reports say, does it really hold ground for future? Because during the past 10, 15 years, it hasn't made any progress in the suitability of the oral treatment. If the oral treatment was to come, I um, think uh, it would have been really a revolution. Sir, we had done study in 300 children for oral treatment. And what we found is that much, that was not much of a difference. I still go for patching is the best thing. Patching is the and best as Dr. Out. Rumil said, it's a um, part-time patching. I'll definitely say because just no, uh, child should not have a mental trauma when they're yeah. patching and going to school. But Actually, uh, Dr. Goel said six hours is necessary. Whenever I think... Four hours. Thank you so much. Hello. In, one, I, in one of the conferences, I remember Pradeep Sharma had been trying some neurotransmitters. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, what, what does he say about it now? What is the report sir, at sir, this time? I, good morning, sir. Goel, sir. Very good morning. Oh, good morning, sir. Sir, how are you? I have been I, seeing you since yesterday. अरे सर बहुत आपकी तबीयत कैसी है आपको कोरोना हो गया था ठीक है बिल्कुल फाइन बर्थडे विश कीजिए सर ओ वेरी वेरी हैप्पी बर्थडे सर वेरी वेरी हैप्पी बर्थडे एंड इट कोइंसाइड ऑलमोस्ट एवरी टाइम विद द स्पोजी कॉन्फ्रेंस यस यस सर मैं एक छोटी सी बात ऐड ऐड करना चाहता हूं कि नाउ द रीसेंट ट्रेंड ये सिटीकोलिन और एल्टोकोपा तो सब पुराने हो गए अभी जो न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर्स की आपने बात करी देयर आर टू वेरी वेरी गुड न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर्स व्हिच हैव बीन इन अमेरिका दे आर हैव बीन अप्रूव्ड बाय दिस एक तो गाबा है एंड अदर इन यस आई मेंट गाबा पेंटीन यस और एक और मैं नाम भूल गया उसका एक और न्यूरो ट्रांसमीटर है व्हिच आर यू नो व्हिच हेल्प इन द साइनेप्टिक 
uh, you know the to to accelerate the synapses and uh, you know to accelerate and rejuvenate the neurons to gaba or acetylcholine ka jo tha wo uh, iske ek uh, wo drug aa gaya main naam bhul gaya uska these products have are now being tried as a neurotransmitter directly given as oral and as an iv to to stimulate and rejuvenate the um, ड्रग्स Ibuprofen, they are working through the same pathway. Yes. But gabapentin, by as, as such, is not being the drug of uh, trial. Yes. No, no, but it is. It is again coming into vogue now. It is again coming. They are trying again because in the pathway, different is Pradeep ji. Well, our next topic is uh, pharmacological agents in amblyopia. We can discuss the rest part after <laughs> Dr. Chawla yes, lectures. Yes, yes, yes. We have uh, started this discussion earlier than what. She is to say, well, Dr. Urmil Chawla, invite yes, sir, you. Yes, can I start? Yeah. Uh, before we go there, because it has been too much of a technical discussion, can I just share my screen real quick? Um, and who is speaking? This is Nipam on behalf of Drishti Netralaya. Thank you very much, all of you. Awesome. Uh, let's can wish Dr. Let's wish Dr. Goel happy birthday. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Many many happy returns of the day. आप पहले बोलते हैं सर happy birthday. आप पहले बोलते हो तो केक भी virtually कटवा देते हैं आपसे. केक केक हर साल स्पोर्ट्स कॉन्फ्रेंस में काटा है मैंने. खा लेंगे ना? मैं यही तो याद कर रहा हूँ. काट के खा लेंगे डॉक्टर बी. कॉन्ट्रोल में पूल साइड पे पेट केक काटा है. Twelfth of December is my birthday actually. नहीं आपको केक दिखा के और हम आपके नाम से काट के खा लेते हैं. And after कर लेते हैं अगर आप बोलो तो अभी केक दिखा देते हैं और क्या कर सकते हैं सर? मैंने तो बहुत सारे आपके से कराए हैं. केक टुडे. अच्छा please carry on यार please. Any out of the way. बहुत अच्छी है सर आज. Quail साहब. I think we are running short of time. Please. Yeah please please. Yeah Dr. Chavla please. Yes sir please may I share the screen? Uh, good afternoon one and all and uh, i just continuing in this basic strabismus session a basic topic and continuing further with where dr gadia had uh, started the conversation uh, my topic is role of pharmacological agents for treatment of amblyopia am i audible yes yes okay. so amblyopia as we know is a sleepy eye or a lazy eye it is not a dead eye with dead brain connection the connections are just lying dormant and we need to just activate them the most common cause of preventable blindness with prevalence of 1 to 5% and being treatable is the reason why we want to treat it uh, the goal of treatment is to restore and improve the visual acuity by two strategies first is to either we present a clear retinal image to the amblyopic eye and that can be done by eliminating the causes of visual deprivation or correcting the various refractive errors or post or compel the child to use the amblyopic eye and the recommended treatments have to be based on the patient's age the visual acuity compliance with previous treatment and physical social and psychological status a perfect amblyopia therapy should be effective with good compliance acceptable to the patients and parents quick in action safe to use easy to administer cost effective and well maintained and the choices of treatment are used alone or in combination to achieve the goal of treatment it could be a passive therapy where the patient experience a change in visual stimulation without any conscious effort which could be proper refractive correction occlusion or penalization or it could be an active therapy like pleoptics near activities synotonic phototherapy role of perceptual learning and pharmacological therapy which would i would go ahead the limitations of present treatments are the presence of residual amblyopia which is left poor compliance to patching the recurrence of amblyopia poor effect in older children and it does not address the deficits in binocular system so comes the role of pharmacological agents in amblyopia uh first talking about penalization it is a therapeutic technique performed by optically defocusing the eye um, <laughs> and it can be
be done either pharmacological penalization or optical penalization. Uh, the indications are uh, patients who are not, not compliant to occlusion, mild degree of amblyopia, maintenance after occlusion, and isometropic amblyopia. Uh, the pharmacological penalization, it is an effective method of treatment for mild to moderate amblyopia in children. One drop of 1% atropine is instilled daily in the good eye. Uh, weekly installation is effective for mild amblyopia and it provides sufficient blur to force the child to use amblyopic eye for near and good eye for distance. Advantages and does not totally disrupt the binocular vision. Uh, cyclopentolate can be used in an office test to predict whether penalization will work or not. And it in this that uh, we provide them like eye with full optical correction while deadening the sound eye with cyclopentolate and removing the optical correction from the sound eye. If the patient switches to the amblyopic eye under these conditions, the patient will definitely improve with atropine penalization and we can go ahead with it. Uh, we, it can be done as near penalization where the fixing eye is atropinized and fully corrected for distance while the amblyopic eye is overcorrected with plus two or plus three diopter. It could be a distance penalization where the fixing eye is atropinized and overcorrected and the amblyopic eye is fully corrected. While in total penalization, the fixing eye is atropinized and undercorrected and the amblyopic eye is fully corrected. So these methods of penalization we can follow. And as Dr. Dadia covered these PDIC studies in ATS-1, it showed that atropine and patching are equally effective as primary treatment for moderate amblyopia. Uh, ATS-4 uh, told that weekend and daily atropine uh, can produce similar improvement for moderate amblyopia. However, the advantages are cheap and better compliance, but it definitely has side effects of the drugs, risk of occlusion, amblyopias, their systemic absorption can be there and it doesn't work well in myopic patients. And unless penalization decreases the visual acuity of dominant eye below the amblyopic eye, this form of treatment is not advised. So we have to uh, confirm this in the very beginning. Uh, coming to other pharmacological drugs, uh, history dates back that these drugs have been tried, substances, these oxygen, strychnine, alcohol, propranolol, picusulin, and exogenous nerve growth factor. However, none were successful in terms of clinical applicability and effectiveness. Liver dopa and carbidopa combination, as Dr. Goel was saying, uh, Kasamatsu and Pettigrew in an animal study showed that even older amblyopic animals could cover some function if their brain is flooded with dopaminergic drugs. And uh, dopamine has been known to play an important role in retinal function and in central visual processing. However, it cannot be administered as such since it is unable to cross the blood-brain barrier. Therefore, the need of this combination is there. Uh, it is a precursor of liver dopa is a precursor of dopamine and it easily crosses the blood-brain barrier. Carbidopa is a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor which prevents the peripheral conversion of liver dopa to dopamine and hence it increases the availability of liver dopa in the CNS and allows for reduction in the dose by about 75%. Uh, an RCT conducted in 2015, however, because literature shows mixed opinion, it showed that for children in 7 to 12 years of age with residual amblyopia, after patching therapy, oral levodopa while continuing to patch 2 hours daily, it does not produce a clinically or statistically meaningful improvement in visual acuity compared with placebo and patching. Another splilet study conducted uh, how, showed that uh, the visual acuity after this combination temporarily improved in amblyopic eyes, but the improvement in visual function started to decrease five hours after the drug ingestion. So this was a little problematic. There are a number of other studies uh, conducted by O. Jetal in 2015. He concluded that oral levodopa can be of benefit in the treatment of amblyopia in older age group patients. Repka et al. said that oral levodopa is equivalent with patching provides no additional be benefit over the placebo therapy. Kothari et al. said that oral levodopa should be combined with occlusion therapy only for residual amblyopias. Russia et al. concluded that levodopa may be added to the occlusion therapy for good result. As uh, Dr. Dadia just mentioned in a study conducted in 2009, they concluded that improvement in visual acuity with levodopa is maintained, especially in patients younger than 8 years of age group. Uh, Mohan et al. concluded that addition of full-time occlusion therapy to levodopa helps to maintain visual equity for a longer period compared to levodopa alone combined with part-time uh, uh, occlusion. And VIEW et al. concluded that levodopa is a safe and effective drug for improving visual equity functions in children with refractory amblyopia. So, uh, the, as far as the doses is, dosage is concerned, it is usually administered along with carbidopa in a 4 is to 1 dose ratio, oral tablet or as oral suspension. Liquid suspensions have been shown to be stable for around 28 days when stored at 25 degree. 
the drug is bitter in taste so needs a protein drink along with it and we how it is well tolerated in children uh, the dose dosage is kept around 0.5 to 0.76 of levodopa plus carbidopa of 0.17 mg per kg body weight uh, three times a day it should be given and oral dosing should be less than minus uh, less than 1.02 mg per kg body weight three times daily to prevent any change in body temperature which is it is known if more than this dose is given however it has limitations of side effects like headache nausea dry mouth abdominal cramp uh, treatment remains controversial as visual acuity improvement has been relatively small not clearly better than patching alone and there are questions regarding the long term stability of vision coming to the next drug the citicoline it is an intermediate by product involved in the biosynthesis of cell membrane phospholipid it gets degraded into in con its constituent constituents of cytidine and choline it once absorbed crosses the blood brain barrier and gets incorporated into the cell membrane phospholipid campos et al also reported a statistically significant improvement in visual acuity following treatment with citicoline it is given as a dose of 1000 mg intramuscularly for 15 days daily in older children and found that significant visual improvement occurred in both amblyopic eye and sound eye which remained stable for at least 4 months after stopping the treatment the dose is kept as 7 to 28 mg per kg body weight but uh, the limitation mean is that there are lack of well defined rcts uh, proving the uh, its effect there are other some drugs which are being experimented donapazil is one of the drug the the, the study is continuing to study its effect on residual amblyopia in patients 8 years of age the results are expected soon somewhere this month only uh, and, uh, now the latest in the armamentarium of treatment of pharmacological drugs are the omega fatty acids a uh, study on these uh, uh, has been done and it has concluded that they improve visual acuity in patients with amblyopia and maintain improved visual acuity but there is no additional benefit when compared to patching alone but uh, further research on this uh, should be done and they may prove out to be of some help uh, dha study is also continuing right now and the results are expected somewhere uh, next year so let's see how it comes out to be so to conclude i would say that the inadequacy of conventional occlusion treatment therapy and non compliance of patients led to an insight into the role of pharmacological therapy for the management of amblyopia although occlusion of the dominant eye is the best treatment modality for amblyopia its efficacy decreases with age and so the need for alternative methods various studies have shown improvement in visual acuity and vp amplitude with these pharmacological agents and uh, mm. levodopa may be considered as, a, as an adjunct to conventional occlusion therapy in cases with residual amblyopia and also mm. in the older age group and regression of effect after stoppage of therapy and occlusion amblyopia in younger patients remain a matter of concern and further studies are therefore needed to evaluate the full efficacy and side effect profile and also mm. to find out new pharmacological agents which can be helpful for the treatment thank you so much for the patient thank you dr urmil i think it was a nice presentation Uh, i have a small con uh, comment to make well so far we have have been in lectures that by far the patching is the excellent method but if the patching has not been possible alternatively penalization may be tried but it wouldn't be as effective as patching one yes. should always remember that it will not be an alternative to patching it will be only a small addition that the amblyopia can be prevented or treated and by far the amblyopia treatment still remains a bug bear many children do improve they cannot follow it up then patching stops and then it comes back squint is operated one observation i don't know if one of you have it that where patching is not possible we do certainly do a penalization will an early surgery restoring alignment will help in uh, improving the vision that is number 1 the second observation which we had made earlier was that when we did a keratoplasty in one eyed patients the vision improved far more quicker than in those who had a normal other eye that shows the role of uh, patching which is really significantly positive uh, any comments about uh, this thing by anybody
सुभाष सर आई थिंक पैचिंग इज गोइंग टू स्टे एंड या the patching is the pivotal I, point for emlapia and it is yeah. going to be there patching is going to stay because i yeah. don't think uh, uh, we can find an alternative any role of early surgery by any one of you that where patching is not possible we correct align the eyes and Sir, then the binocular uh, stimulus to improve the vision yeah you are absolutely time. correct sir you are absolutely there. correct because early surgery will definitely help for early binocular development yeah that's the and point once the binocular develops the many other visual deficits also develops gradually that i have, that is my observation and i am happy with early surgery also where the patching is very difficult well your games are quite popular with children i also i also are they yeah, as yeah, effective yeah. as patching that's yeah the yeah they are Especially in uh, all these high risk babies, these Anyhow, visual games after the age of two years. You, but I have, I, have, I, I want to share. Sir. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, I have, I have observation. If I can recall, at least two patients I remember that, uh, and one of them had happened to be a doctor's uh, daughter. So these patients were not complying, uh, very much compliant for occlusion therapy, and they were not improving very nicely with occlusion therapy. So I tried them, uh, tried on them corrective prisms. Try it. Corrective prism along with the corrective refractive. Corrective point. Correct. Yes, yes. That's and what I prism, put a and, proposal. And yes, and because you see uh, that the uh, corrective prism. ensures by by foveal or at least the foveal stimulation of the squinting eye and these patients who were earlier not improving in vision they improved with prism therapy it may be worth a trial yes so uh, i think that uh, so if occlusion is not working or there is no compliance penalization of course may work in some patients but early surgery can be considered well thank you very much uh, dr dr sumita wants to say something dr sumita yeah. i i am going to take a slightly contrarian view here because vision is the driving engine for binocularity if vision is poor surgery will not help and oh, they yeah. almost always tend to go for um, a, a consecutive uh, exo or iso whatever depending on the alignment is never stable one and if the patient is not at all compliant uh, i don't think yeah dr vinita singh okay. suggestion about uh, prisms uh, i think prisms probably if it's a small angle you can do it but if it's only in small angle, angle. yes it's it is not for surgery in large angle squints yes yeah yeah but that is uh, you you when you put 45 prisms you are going to no, 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 no. We, are, we are talking of a small angle in this small angle. particular okay. child that i am talking of i think we'll yeah. come to the next speaker may i request urmil chawla to call the next speaker uh yes sir one minute uh sablin kaur uh, yeah I, i request dr sablin kaur everybody knows her she is from pgi chandigarh a very young energetic and uh, vibrant spossy member i invite you i just i think your topic was on imaging in strabismus for chandigarh i remember i was once selected for the post of assistant professor to begin thing of my career but some i didn't join so i missed yes chandigarh life <laughs> completely i you continued to stay you in aligarh you came closer to us it was during the time of dr jain when he selected me and invited me to join the faculty but i couldn't somehow so you can we stick to time because dr shukla sir is repeatedly so, telling me be strict be strict and the thing is going so late that's a big discuss in chat also Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goel. It's I think PGI is lost that you were not here. So uh, since yeah. we are talking about uh, imaging, and uh, we have already spoken about uh, emblyopia, so I would be talking a little bit about the basic pathogenesis because that's where I think imaging is now helping us, and some points where clinical examination can be complemented with these newer imaging technologies. so to the hands of a pediatric ophthalmologist i think we have a lot of imaging modalities available and it will be unfair if i start speaking about all of them so i'm going to talk about some of my favorite ones and since we have talked about emlyopia i would begin with that first 
so the optical coherence angiography tomography that is the oct a that is now a budding uh, investigation in the retina field to us it has been used in amblyopia because it has been used to establish the retinal functional changes because we were always talking about the neuro neurological aspects of amblyopia and how it has been caused but now that we have these imaging modalities we are trying to see whether actual the retinal function is also normal in these patients there have been a lot of studies that have come up with the octa in all types of amblyopia just in brief this is how an octa image looks like and the first study reported that there is a macular vascular density decreased in patients who have amblyopia the foveal avascular zone was also reported to be enlarged and also the optic disc did not have the normal perfusion vis-a-vis -a, -vis a normal fellow eye and also control eyes so we tried to do the same thing and we saw that when we try to image oct a in patients of anisometropic amblyopia as well as strabismic amblyopia this is how a normal vessel density would look like and their vessel density at the superficial and the cap uh, the deep layer was reduced and the corio capillary network was also attenuated so there were different areas where the flow was actually low compared to a normal fellow eye so we concluded that the pathogenesis of amblyopia might be involving the corio capillaries which is the primary blood supply for the photoreceptors so now we do know that we do have these deficits in patients who have unilateral as well as bilateral amblyopia the contralateral eye can also not be considered equivalent so that is a drawback of all these studies we do document these vascularization defects but we do not know whether they are causative for amblyopia or is it because of amblyopia that we see these defects so the cause effect relationship cannot be established we cannot use this at present with the evidence available as marker of neuronal maturity whether octa changes would be reversed we would see with times to come whether amblyopia treatment changes this uh, changes seen on the octa nevertheless it's a useful modality and can be used to establish and further study the basic pathogenesis of amblyopia the second imaging modality that's uh, kind of my favorite the ubm and the as oct again in cases where for example this one you have an exotropia in a country like ours where you do not might not have an electronic medical record system at many places you might not have the previous surgical records you do see the photographs and diagnose the patient as consecutive exotropia but you have to still decide how much surgery to do so obviously you decide it on tables you want to explore and see where the muscles are but the ubm to my mind can make your planning a little better can cause a little bit less of scarring because you are not uh, fishing too much for the muscle so a normal ubm will tell you the muscle morphology from the limbus you can see it uh, between the uh, the limbus is identified first and then you go back and try to image the muscle which is seen as the hypoechoic band and once you see the muscle you can measure it with the help of this inbuilt caliper in the machine you can see resected muscles with experience we come to know whether it's a pseudo tendon because it is not a continuous band and in some cases you can actually see whether the muscle is not seen within 10 to 14 mm of the limbus and then you can plan a transposition surgery maybe so in re surgeries it is a little uh, more difficult the accuracy to 1 mm if you get that i think you will call it a i would call it a success that you have accurately identified the muscle within 1 mm because often you see a lot of scarring and you have to do it uh, you need the help of experienced technicians also to, in order to image the muscle so in this patient once we did the ubm we saw that the medial rectus was at 10.8 mm so we advanced the medial rectus to the original insertion and we got a good a successful a post operative result we did uh, establish and we did publish uh, one of the thesis uh, of our residents dr namita that ubm is efficacious when you do not have a surgery done and in cases where you think you are doing it post operatively the accuracy goes down to say about 78% for the medial and 50% for the lateral rectus implications often not in the early post operative period you can see this double shadow and you can actually measure the amount of plication as twice the length of this double shadow which again we published that plication although similar to the resection in quantitative terms you can image it so it might give you an advantage where would i need a ubm i would say in cases where i always uh, like to do it is facial asymmetry craniosynostosis or where i know there is trauma and i can expect um, abnormal muscle so i'm more sure whether i 
when i go to the operating room of course the gold standard is when i see the muscle on the table in case of resurgeries i like to do these modalities because i am lucky that i have access to both of these and it might not be very reliable in patients who have undergone very large resections there my the measurements can be really really off the mark in children in uncooperative patients here is where the second modality comes that is the asoct which is non contact it's better it's uh, clearer and we are in the process of publishing it we did publish our views in uh, japos and now i think they it does give a good accuracy in resurgeries also despite being non contact method and better delineation for scar and migrated muscles uh, any talk in strabismus is incomplete if we do not talk about neuroimaging we all know neuroimaging can be indispensable and has been used for decades few instances where i feel neuroimaging really help is that this patient uh, referred for an up gaze limitation actually diagnosed as a monocular elevation deficit but if we see carefully he did seem to have a little bit of proptosis and a lid change also so i ordered a neuroimaging and before doing anything else and it was an optic nerve glioma that we picked a case of abnormal eye movements i would like to share where the mother kept on saying that one eye moves and my residents felt that there is nothing abnormal with the child but when we carefully looked at there was in a stagmus in actually one eye if you see carefully a small upward drift seen in this patient and uh, after a little bit of more examination this upward drift along with that because it was geniocular we let the mother tell us when the child has a stagmus and we let him photograph us we saw this head bobbing also along with that so in these cases i think uh, with the stagmus head bobbing and torticollis sometimes the uh, diagnosis is quite clear so spasm newtons mri was normal but we knew that we had to order an mri straight away so neuroimaging in the first visit in children when do you order that you should not do it always obviously in a country like ours there are cost constraints so if you have systemic signs you have lid changes or globe displacements abnormal asymmetric new movement disturbances or of course we have suspected intraocular masses and disc edemas those are the indications that to my mind we can order neuroimaging even in the first visit uh, for children and then hold on after a clinical opinion to conclude there is no technology that is perfect in every setting we often have uh, limitations we do not have the right staff we do not have uh, the right machines we do not have cooperative patients because we are all pediatric ophthalmologists we need to develop thoughtful testing strategy to minimize cost also not order unnecessary investigations as well we can use the most sophisticated instrument available with us but without not without a thorough clinical examination thank you very much i would like to acknowledge dr jasveet who has been giving inputs on almost all of my studies thank you very much thank you shavleen for giving new ideas but would you recommend a ubm for all cases or only in limited cases where you expect structural abnormalities in the muscles I do not order them in all cases, sir. Even if uh, because, I have access, uh, in, yes. Because one of the statements I thought that it will be useful to do in every surgery before every surgery. In I don't think surgery, it would sir, be really recommended. In resurgeries, I uh, do it because resurgery is access. all right. Resurgeries not and not in all, sir. No, yes. no, no, sir. Not in primary surgeries. I think because you have to no, you no. have to modify your <laughs> surgical procedures once you open up the muscles. and only then decide what you have to do so only in these surgeries and any other comments any other comments because i think uh, the nowadays we have some more additions which are coming one is the dynamic mri which we can do in different gazes that will yeah. help in the aberrant innervations then we have the aoslo that is another new technology with the help of voronoi tiles we have recently uh, completed that study and maybe we are sending it for publication in cases of amyotrophic amblyopia in an isometropic amblyopia is obviously the uh, these uh, imaging is not showing much of result there are variable yeah. but in that it's an interesting thing that we're getting fmri is another diagnostic tool for amblyopia so i think these and ccdds we have the uh, high definition mris which have we have published in cases of duanes mobius and cfums so we we may be wiser in the next conference dr pradeep yeah yeah right in publication yeah Yeah. Uh, then may I invite the next Dr. Sumita Agarkar, please. Okay, uh, Dr. Sh.
Sumita? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Happy birthday to uh, Dr. Oh, thank Boya. you very much. Thank yes. you. So I'm going to talk about not just refraction in children, but difficult situation for refractions in children. And thank you, Dr. Shreya, for this opportunity. So when my when we are interviewing the kids and interviewing the kids for fellowship and when they tell me that they love children, I usually show them this video and a lot of them do have second thoughts about their career choices after that. And <coughs> so, so among all children, probably the most difficult but still doable are the infants, uh, children with special needs or special children, post-trauma uh, sometimes you need a little bit of more patience. Uh, Subluxate lenses and keratoconus. A lot of times we don't pay enough attention to the refraction part of it. Uh, and really um, a little bit trigger happy when it comes to advising surgery in these two situations. So coming to infants, uh, it's really challenging in pre-verbal -pre children. And here probably you have to pay attention to the fixing pattern pupillary right reflexes and visual behavior that provides more information than actually anything else. Dr. Mihir Kothari's study on uh, fixation preference is uh, being very specific for poor vision is, is very, very important piece of um, evidence there. And when you are looking at fixation mm -hmm. pattern, it's also important to know to how and follows the light. Uh, if you can see this child who has relatively is amblyopic in the right ear, but has relatively good vision, actually follows light with her eyes only, and you don't see that much movement of the head or uh, anything she is fixing. So she has probably relatively good vision compared to this child who has a persistent RD despite ROP surgery. And you can see it's only the head which tracks the light and not really the eyes. So that gives you an idea about in very, very small infants about how vision might be. Children with poor vision often only follow using the head and not the eyes. Um, again, resistance to occluding one eye is also an indicator for how an infant might have, whether she has equal or he or she has equal vision or, uh, and uh, VEP is a good response, but often in infants, it is not very reliable. And uh, while a good VEP is a good uh, backup or a good feeling, but bad VEP does not necessarily uh, indicate poor vision and that must be kept in mind, uh, especially when you are um, doing a VEP in a children who are younger than one year. So as I said, key, other visual acuity methods like Cardiff or Taylor cards can be available. Uh, if, if they are available with you, they often provide quantitative information, though they are expensive and have their own limitations in terms of cooperation and attentiveness of the child. Uh, and often subjective visual assessment often gives you better clue than the instrument-based screening like VEP or a photo screener. But this is a tailored chart and you can see, uh, it gives you a little bit idea about grading equity and uh, depending on the grading size used, uh, the observer is behind and through the pinhole and uh, you look at the child whether she is looking at the pattern and the grading which we are used gives you an, some kind of quantitative analysis but again as you can see limitations are straight away that child has to be attentive looking cooperative not upset not hungry all those things to make a reliable assessment about the vision of this child uh, Leah panels again can be used in very small children and looking at the tracking. And again, this gives you a quantitative analysis of vision in very, very young babies in cycles per minute. And again, this can be done initially bilaterally, and then you can check it unilaterally also. The principle remains same. The child will look at a uh, patterned object, more likely to look at a patterned object. It's a preferential looking test. Now coming to the refraction, practically it, when you're dealing with infants, it, it is just a quick screening to see if the baby is, has a very high plus or high minus, which is, requires prescription. We are really not looking at uh, refining it to the last 0.5 cylinder. Dilatation definitely helps and your own retinoscopy helps very, very, it's very useful rather than asking your optometrist to do it. Brightness of reflex also gives a indication about the 
refractive error. Sometimes dull reflex can indicate a very high plus or a very high minus. And in that case, you really need not go from 1.5 to 2 and 3.5. You can probably straight away put plus 8 and minus 8 and to see how it is uh, giving. So these are practical tips about doing uh, refraction in very young babies. Uh, there are several prescription guidelines available and they help you decide. Uh, in fact, AIOS has come up with a very, very practical guidelines for our children here. And uh, it can give you uh, an idea about whether the prescription has to be done or not. Uh, but also it's important to guide parents on frames, especially in infants, because infants often do not have a nose bone which is developed. And uh, a poorly fitting glass is, is the main reason why they will not wear glasses rather than your level American Academy, but you can use uh, any one of, even AIOS guideline is very good. Um, second important or difficult refraction is aphakia. Again, bilateral aphakes do very well with glasses and I have really no objection to treating bilateral aphakes with glasses. If you can fit with contact lens, very good, but if you don't, then you can uh, give the glasses as early as in the first week of the surgery. Uh, when you are dealing with infants less than six months, I think it is a good idea to prescribe a near correction rather than uh, distance correction or bifocal glasses. And once the children become one year or more, you can give them an intermediate correction with say 1.5 add. Don't worry about small cylinders. Again, here design of frame is very, very important. Bifocals, usually I start when they start, they are ready for school. Uh, unilateral effects, probably you should push for contact lens uh, and that to RGP. But if patients are not willing, not unable to take care of contact lens, please go ahead and give the glasses. Children tolerate anisoconia much better than adults and you really are not uh, giving them any, you are not causing any disadvantage by giving a fake glass in one eye rather than not prescribing anything at all. Uh, special children are extra special challenges. There is an increasing incidence, ironically, because neonatal care has improved, but not improved as much to give them no, mo no morbidities. So while they survive, but they have a lot of times multiple disabilities, cognitive impairment, and difficulty in assessing. And of course, there are very, very few places in India which provide specialized care. They almost always have a critical visual impairment and functional visual assessment is again more important than looking for CSM or looking for uh, uh, Snellen's equity. Certain visual behaviors also can point towards impairment. Uh, so as I said, sometimes if the children looks down, the, probably there may be an altitudinal defect. And here again, a very quick video about a functional visual assessment. You can ask the child, Lia tests are very useful and you need not ask them to spell it out the card, but ask them to match it. Sometimes that matching helps them uh, orient it much better than actually orally articulating. Especially the high functioning in uh, CBI children often are able to match rather than uh, orally say the number. Again, children who have more severe disabilities often need a functional visual assessment. As I said, this is a small workup of how we do deal with these children uh, in clinic. So often if you see the child is really tends to bang into big things because he has field defect and he has. I think we could go to the conclusions. Well, Dr. Urmil, uh, your comments before it comes back. No, I have only a small. Sir? Yeah, go on. Please, sir, please, sir. please carry on. I'll say. Okay. I have only a small suggestion to go. I don't know how many of you are following that whenever we are operating a child, even if we have been able to do refraction earlier properly, do it under general anesthesia. And I always carried a small portable set, keeler set for this purpose in the operation theater till my last practice. So that would be a good idea to reconfirm the refraction we have done earlier. Uh, Sumita, you have anything else to add further? Because it, Dr. Chavala, any comments about it? Uh, it was a good, a wonderful talk by Dr. Sumita, sir. 
and uh, obviously it is a very tedious job to deal with this special yeah. uh, category of children and also the infants and uh, these small clues which ma'am has mentioned in her talk the various clues we should be keeping in mind while dealing them mm -hmm. and lot of effort from our staff from us has to be taken to uh, elicit their visual acuity properly and that and follow them with their refractive error and all so that should be there patience on our side is a lot needed recently sir i had a very interesting experience like sumita was saying it is difficult to occlude one eye while doing refraction and the patient is not fixing so you want to occlude one eye you know so i had a very small child like 2 and a half year old and he would just not cooperate so i uh, you know you give them a toy then they start looking at the toy instead of looking in front so this inc incidentally mujhe purana ek apna retinoscopy mirror mil gaya maine usko wo pakda diya just 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 to make him like cooperate a little and he started doing retinoscopy for me like this you know so by by asking him to do it with this eye and then with this eye i was able to have one eye occluded and the other eye straight for refraction dr vidita i had a small toy attachment on my glasses in the center because i had been always using glasses that would uh, make the child look towards my face at least of course you may uh, test the refraction for near not for distance but it was quite convenient to do it sir, so try that squinting. if you have a toy attached to your center of the yes glass. sir but if, if they are squinting you want them oh. to be straight yeah well, it's just a thing anyhow any other comments because we are already around 10 minutes late dr khurana seems to be keen to uh, say something Good afternoon. I just want to say happy birthday to you, sir. Everyone. <laughs> I think right. Thank you, Doctor Urmil, for co-chairing the session. Thank you, sir. It's an so, honor and, to share the dice uh, with you. And, and uh, Doctor Shreya for you, this sir. excellent situation. Thank See you. you in the general body meeting next. Of course, I am on the conference. I may interact whenever necessary. Thank you all. Thank you. Sorry, my uh, internet went off for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you for the opportunity. It's a wonderful talk, ma'am. Yeah.